Good morning, everyone. I'm Andrea Sato. I work on adult programs, and we're very uh, pleased to have you here for this morning's session presented by SpedNet. Um, we're glad to continue to partner with SpedNet, as well as the Wilton Public Schools and Newtown Sped PTA on many important programs for parents of kids with special needs. Before I turn the program over to Robin of SpedNet to introduce our speaker, let me take this opportunity to tell you about a few upcoming programs you might be interested in. Next Tuesday morning, February 13th, the Wilton Youth Council, SpedNet, and the Wilton Library are sponsoring a panel called Building Life Skills Through Play for parents of kids pre-K through grade five. This program will discuss the importance of free play to build those life skills all our children need. Then on Tuesday, the following Tuesday, the 20th, there's an adult program different to celebrate Black History Month from two to three in the afternoon with the Serendipity Chorale, who will sing gospel songs and spirituals, as well as talk about the role of this music played in black history, not to be missed. Also, just to let you know, our uh, assistant uh, head of the library asked that we mention we have a robust collection of parenting books here for parents of teens and young children, so check them out. So with that, I'll turn it over to Robin. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm here representing SpedNet. I'm actually on the board of SpedNet. Um, before I introduce Todd, I just want to talk a little bit about SpedNet because it's kind of a unique organization. It's completely volunteer run. So um, it was created about 25 years ago as a nonprofit by a group of parents who felt that other parents needed help um, to be able to be their child's best advocate. Um, so SpedNet is known for putting on webinars, presentations, running support groups. Um, they have a fantastic website that's very accessible and has a lot of um, videos of previous presentations on various topics. Um, and they also published uh, an interactive guide to special services, which is really, really um, useful. Um, so now but we'll talk about Todd, because Todd has presented before for SPEDNA. I think a lot of us are familiar with Todd's work. Todd um, Kellogg is a licensed marriage and family therapist and a board certified and licensed behavior analyst who has worked in the field of disabilities since 1994. He specializes in providing structural family and behavior therapy to resolve challenging and maladaptive behaviors in youth and young adults. An additional area of work and expertise includes the development of social awareness and skills through individual therapy and consultations, small group settings, and within the larger community. Uh, over the years, Mr. Kellogg has provided several workshops and trainings across a wide range of topics, including positive behavior supports, effective co-parenting, functional behavior assessments and planning, effective communications during the PPT process, social skills interventions for children with hidden disabilities, strategies to address eating-related issues, building resilience and grit in children through trial and error learning, developing ha healthy habits and daily routines. Mr. Kellogg currently works out of his private practice on a part-time basis while spending time on several professional projects and endeavors. Uh, so before I turn it over, I just want to make a couple of uh, kind of housekeeping notes. Um, first of all, as Andrea noted, um, we have partners. SpedNet has several partners that we want to recognize in this presentation. The Wilton Library, uh, Wilton Public Schools, and New in, uh, Newtown, excuse me, SPED PTA. Um, this is an open forum, and we are going to be recording 
So we just want to uh, let folks know that, and we cannot guarantee confidentiality. So if you have a, any questions, you may not want to reveal your private information in your questions. Um, the recording will be sent out to all the registrants um, on the email list and will also be posted on the SpedNet website along with the uh, PowerPoint and the other materials. Um, and it, this presentation is for informational purposes only and does not represent medical or legal advice. And finally, if you haven't already signed in, um, I know you checked in at the front desk, but we do have um, a sign-in sheet to be on the SpedNet mail, uh, email list. So if you're not on that email list already, please take a minute to sign in in the back and note your email so you can get information about future programs. Um, and with that's it. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Todd. Thank you. I'm going to use this because I like to walk around. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Robin and SpedNet and Andrea and the Wilton Library. Um, when I first got here, I don't know if anybody's ever done any presentations, but for anybody who presents, there's always a moment of anxiety when you bring your computer and you try to hook it up and get the sound going and yada, yada, yada. And everything was ready to go. So I walked in and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like a presenter's dream. So I, I thank you for all that. So uh, it's a pleasure. Um, I think it's great that this is being recorded and you have the handouts and you, there's a few uh, really important key documents that I'll point out to you that you uh, definitely, definitely want to get your hands on. Uh, not just the slides, but uh, some important um, articles. Okay, so this is a, very, a favorite topic of mine. The reason why it's my favorite topic, one of them at least, is because uh, th there's very few areas out there that are so well-researched. This is tremendously well-researched. There are very rock-solid ways to help a child or an adult, whoever it might be, grow and develop better eating habits. And, and so that's so gratifying because we're not out there trying to figure it out as we go in this particular area. So with that in mind, I, um, I was asked to do this topic again, I don't know, maybe six, nine months ago. So I said, all right, uh, happy to do it. Uh, last time I presented on this was maybe a couple years ago. So let me just do a Google search and see what's out there. If I was a parent who was having a child struggle with picky eating or selective eating, you know, what would I be finding if I Googled it? And so sure enough, there's just a small sample. There's thousands of things you can find, <laughs> but this is just three, uh, the first three that popped up. So I'll just skip around. You have this like in your slides, and you can like, if you wanted to search up these articles, you can. I thought this was really good here. Are you a picky eater? This is for adults right here. Like if an adult, like what do you do when you, you know, when you, when you have a selective eating and maybe it's getting in the way of your social life or something like that. So um, that's actually very helpful. And what's helpful about it is when I read it, I'm looking for some key information. Like, does a research come out into that article? Now, they might not, this is a very friendly article, so it's meant for the casual reader observer. They're not gonna reference anything uh, as far as their research, but certain things pop out. So the number 15 in that article comes out, the number 15, and we'll talk about the number 15 later, but it says, oh, you know, your taste Palettes and all that, you know, sometimes it takes about 15 to 18 times to get used to something. Very important number. They don't tell you what's behind that number, but I will. And so that was interesting. This one here, um, that was a very helpful article because it kind of went into some very common sense advice, like, you know, eating together as a family, even if you can't all eat together, at least having one parent or an adult with a child. So like in the morning when the child, you know, is getting ready for school, is a child eating breakfast alone, or can an adult sit down, have a cup of coffee, and just have something small with them, so that they get used to the idea that this is something that we do together. And that simple like proximity and being available correlates to better eating habits, but also just like mixing it up a little bit, like really cool ideas, like um, for those kids who are particularly rigid, to even mix up the dishware. You know, don't always eat out of the same bowl. Don't always drink out of the same cup. 
the reason why it's like, what's I have to do with anything? Well, believe it or not, uh, people who are, tend to be picky or rigid tend to really hold on to some very environmental cues that we might not be aware of. Working with a lot of children with autism, one suggestion that you'll see later on in the slides is get rid of the original packaging of the food. If something like McDonald's french fries, like now that's a bad example maybe, but honestly, the packaging, a child who particularly is very rigid around their eating or selective will grab onto that visual identity and they'll, they'll only eat out of that particular packaging. So it's like, you gotta do yourself a favor and get rid of the packaging and put it in a you know, generic kind of thing so that way you can mix and match every now and then. But I thought that was really interesting. Talked about um, variety is the key. You know, variety is spice of life. The variety is the key. And that was, you know, I thought that was very helpful because that is so true. Like having a variety of foods, a variety of different tastes. You'll see later on, I'll talk about why that's so important when you just to try something that's different or new. And so um, that's a very pivotal characteristic or behavior. So like just branch out and introduce new foods. You know, call different theme nights. A lot of very helpful stuff. And then I came across this article. And this article bothered me a little bit because as I was reading it, I felt like there was an agenda behind it, like a particular model or way to go. And ultimately, at some point, you're going to have to purchase something down, like if you, went, if you went too far into it. The reason why it bothered me, though, is because it, start, it turned the reader away from this being a, a behavioral issue. Um, it, it said it's not in the head, it's in the body, and all that stuff, but just different language. And it referenced at the bottom, it, it says click on the research. And it, the, to their credit, they referenced, uh, I don't know, I didn't count them all, but probably 12 different, 12 different articles all around the world, China, Netherlands, US, you name it. And it's like, okay, this, this seems like it's really credible. The one article it didn't mention though, and I did I searched it, and I'm gonna skip because the next two slides are just out of order, so I'm just gonna go this one right here. They didn't reference this article. It's this guy right here, Dr. Keith Williams. He's one of the experts in our country. He works out of the Penn State feeding clinic. This is a real research article. You will be able to click on this and download it. I promise you, it's, you're gonna wanna, you're gonna wanna read this article. Now we're gonna walk through it to a certain degree. Now the, the thing is, is that, he, so he didn't include this article, I'm like, why wouldn't he include this article? This article, this research, basically sums up everything you need to know. Now the problem is, is what's the name of this article? Practice does not make perfect. A longitudinal look at repeated taste exposure. No one's gonna Google that. <laughs> Repeated, repeated taste exposure. That's too scientific. Of course, he's not reading, he's not, this wasn't written for the average consumer, the person who's gonna Google it. This is written for research, scientists, doctors, MDs, practitioners in the field. This is what this, so you would never see this article most likely. And unfortunately, the person who had that website of all the other articles never even included this. And so I did this search, it's like, you know, what are parents up against? What are parents up against? So we're gonna go into this article, but you definitely want to, you definitely want to um, read that. Okay, so this is a behavioral model, which is good because eating is a behavior, and, but let's put this in perspective. Many of you have, I'm sure all of you have children here, um, or you might be here for yourself, which is fine. But the thing is, is that I, I kinda like, when your kids are really young, Think of like you know when they're you know infants, one, two, three years old, versus when they get older. If you have older children now who are teens, you know preteens, teens, young adults, you get like you realize that over as they get older and bigger and stronger and more autonomous and all that, your ability to influence them shrinks over time. You still influence. You're still there, right? But in the beginning of their life, you're like it. Right, you have all the answers, right? You know, until they start pushing back. But in a way, like you're it, like you're the source of everything. Everything goes through you. 
And then they get to school eventually, and so now they have multiple sources, and so you don't have as much, you have a voice, you have a loud voice still, but now you have, uh, they have other voices in their life. And then as they get older, now they have peers and friends and social media, and so your influence gets a little bit smaller and smaller. It's still there, but it's less and less. Now, based on that, you know, I think everyone can kind of appreciate that. What are the three areas, though, of their life that from day one, like literally, like day one in the hospital or day one at home, what are the three areas that, of behavioral areas that parents have to learn to cope with and deal? And they realize pretty soon, I said the word influence, I didn't say the word control. Now you can control your child as far as, I'm gonna pick you up here and put you over here. And when they're young enough, you're gonna wear red versus blue versus pink versus green. You can, that's, that's within your control until it's not. Right? But what are three areas from the very beginning? These three areas, right away, is my child. The first thing that my first job was to change the diaper, right? That was my job in the hospital. And, and so we were, and of course, think about it, when the kids are young, you are so attentive to their bowel movements and when they're peeing and not peeing and this or this or that. It's like, okay. Are they not going to the bathroom? Why aren't they going to the bathroom? Why are they going to the bathroom that way? Like, you know, it's like it's, so you're like, so there's all that. There's sleeping, right? How much of, how many of you wish that we were in control of their sleeping? Right? We're not. They are. We can influence, though. And then same thing with eating. Early on, I remember my, I, don't, I wasn't a BCBA yet, but I was introduced to a behavioral technique when the child learns to latch on to the mom, if that's the course of, of feeding that you're gonna do, that if the child's not latching on, there is a behavioral approach that they did, they used. I won't get into it, but they used it to like, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, this is, a, this is like a behavioral model. I'm seeing it right in front of me. And so but these are the three things that parents can stay up at night about, right? Today we're gonna to talk about the eating part of it. We can talk about the other stuff another time, but definitely the eating part of it. So get back on track, okay, here we go. So, that research article by Dr. Keith Williams, they, um, they have thousands of kids going through that feeding clinic. Now, picky eaters versus selective eaters versus challenge eaters, you Google that, you're gonna see different definitions out there, right? Picky eater is a more casual, lesser extreme issue than a selective eater and so forth. Well, the Penn State Feeding Clinic had children of all ages, all abilities and disabilities, some of them literally um, with feeding tubes. That's how challenging some of the kids were that went to the, the think about it, if you're gonna go to a feeding clinic, it has to be kind of up there, right, as far as challenge level. But as far as like, you know, feeding tubes, that's pretty, that's pretty high up there. And then some of it has to do with behavioral challenges or disabilities or there is an operation and the child, I remember working with a young girl once who never had food in her mouth until a certain age in her life. And she eventually had puree food for the longest time and eventually started having some solid food like in later elementary years. But she had to relearn all, she had to learn that from new. So it's like, Lots of different reasons why you might have a, a, a challenges around eating. But the, the reason why I'm saying this is because their approach, whether the child has autism, severe autism, not severe autism, sensitivities to different textures, it didn't matter. The, the same approach was used on everybody, and it worked on everybody. So that's, that's I want to let you know that. You don't have to get so consumed about what is it behind this, because if you have the answer, it's going to work. Okay, so... They had access to all these families coming through. So they had surveys. Okay, please answer, you know, part of the application process and getting enrolled in the, food, in the food clinic. And by the way, the clinic had services done there. They had services done at the people's homes. But they were close by and all that. So they had a survey. And they answered all these questions. So this is the kind of stuff you're going to see. Like, you know, 18, 20%, 18 to 26%. That's, you know, you'll see something like 18 to 30% has you know, can be considered picky eaters, right, for children. So it's not that uncommon. Think about, you know, one quarter, 
Now, if there's a disability like autism, that can jump way up, right? So 70% on average for children who are on the spectrum can have food challenges. Severity of autism doesn't matter, right? When it comes to that number, it's 70% across the board. Okay. Um, children will not grow out of it. You probably heard of this before. I think most pediatricians don't say this anymore, though. One of the articles that I Googled up before you know, said, yeah, sometimes doctors say that. They'll grow out of it. They'll try to help you not get too anxious about it. The truth is the matter is they won't. I mean, they could, but the, the about 50% won't on average. And, you know, it, it affects them. Uh, there's, you know, diabetes, obesity, ironically. Obesity because the foods that tend to, they gravitate towards are salty and fatty. And so that tends to, in your metabolism, doesn't always work through that as quickly. And you have less variety. And so, um, so that, that factors in. One of the articles that I Googled that you, know, you can look at you want, like it was pretty, like had some information about college kids. College kids who, you know, pretty much control what they eat at this point. I mean, they always, they did before that, but now they really get to choose. They have, you know, those who are, grew up with picky eating, you know, they on average had less fruits and vegetables and fiber, right? So that kind of stuff. So you, you want to address it at some point, even as a young adult. Okay. So when they did that survey, you know, they asked the parents, okay, what do you feed your children? You know, name of stuff. And what happens when you give them something and they refuse outright? What happens then? So, you know, what do you think the number of, how many times do you think some, a parent, an average parent, an average situation, don't forget now, they got themselves to the feeding clinic, so there's, there's challenges, all right? So the person who has a child that has really picky eating, selective eating, the average parent, how many times do you think they will repeat that food if the child just outright refuses it? You wanna guess? I know the answer's right in front of you. Yeah, it's zero. And you have the answer in front of you, but it's zero. And I, that's on average. And I thought that was remarkable. It's like, you know, because I, I, when I was at this workshop, I, I know I had at least one child. I don't think I had two yet. But I was like, you know, wow, zero. But then that kind of makes sense when you read further. Um, children who may not eat what their parents eat. So basically, what will happen is that, you know, and you guys know this probably, right? I mean, you might have grew up this way too this to a certain degree. It's like, well, the parents will start making that second meal. You know, here's a kid's meal, and here's the, the adult meal. I mean, restaurants do it all the time, right? Of course. I mean, come on, everyone chooses what they want at a restaurant. You have a kid's menu and all that. And the kid's menus, you know, places that you go pretty much look the same, you know, pretty, pretty kid friendly. But at home, if you do that, right, if you do that and you have that separate meal, um, or, or just out of convenience, We'll all eat that stuff. We'll all eat the kid-friendly stuff, you know? So sometimes the family drifts in that way. So if you look at these things, this is just a few lines on here, but if you just stare at that for a moment, and, you know, the, this impacts everybody. This right here, just these steps right here, it, that cements the pattern. That keeps it going. And so if the pivotal variable is child tries something novel, doesn't have to like it, doesn't have to eat more than one bite of it, well, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, just try it. Just try it. And then, but if that doesn't happen and this happens, well, then it's just, it's just it's self-fulfilling at that point. So a little bit of humor here. I love Calvin and Hobbes. I'll let you read. Can you read it? So creative. Calvin doesn't go hungry. Calvin's very smart, right? Who wouldn't do that? So Calvin doesn't go hungry. And, and the reason I have that up here is because, you know, in those surveys, they found that parents, I mean, look, I, let's face it. You're like wired to protect and provide and to feed your children. Them going to bed hungry is not a good feeling. There's something deep, right, that kind of bothers you about that. 
And so, I mean, let's face it. I mean, why, why, of course, think about the human history of survival and all that. I mean, when it really, you know, when you really had to grow your food or hunt it or gather it or whatever, I mean, like, this was a big deal. This took up a lot of your time. And so to not eat what's in front of you and to go to bed hungry, that, does, that doesn't work well for a lot of people. I get it. But the reality is, is that that might have to happen a couple times. So the real issue, trying new foods. That's basically it. Trying new foods. Um, okay, so this next sentence, I would have changed it, but then I would have thrown everything off because it's a little bit harsh. I'm looking at it now. I'm like, oh, Todd, you got to soften up a little bit. Treatment for picky eating or food refusal is no different than with, than with many other behaviors. It boils down to the child learning to follow directions, which is sitting in a chair, not leaving the table, trying small bites of food, yada, yada, yada. Okay. That comes across, as I read it now, it's like, ah, this sounds a little harsh. It's not just about following directions, you know? Um, but it is about trying something. So I was like, okay. I got good news, I got really good news, and I have fantastic news, and it's gonna come in that order. So here's the, um, here's the good news. So the good news is, is that, that number 15, remember I said it before? There it is. So the average person, now this is like not, whenever you say average, it's like, okay, already it's off. Like, what does that mean, Todd? Okay, it means that whatever sample sizes they use to figure this out, the average person has the average number of 15 times to begin to tolerate or like a food item. 15 times, the average person. Okay, so not bad. Now, wait a minute, what about this following direction stuff? I'll get back to that in a second. But think about this. So just trying something. Anything we do for the very first time requires what? Whether you learn how to play golf, skiing, learn a foreign language, learn how to walk, learn how to do anything. It always requires what? One small step. That's it. None of that gets resolved right away. It's just one step at a time. And so I was like, OK. Let's go further here. By the way, the following directions things, eventually, like if this is a real problem in general, you're gonna have a harder time with these, uh, these approaches, all of them. So this does matter, but it's not just that. It's not just that. But you definitely wanna have this worked out here. I remember there's a little boy, there's a bo little boy, he's not a little boy anymore. I'm gonna show you a bunch of pictures later on of the different things that he eventually learned how to eat. But I met this young guy, and he was like three years old. And I worked with him for most, whole, practically his whole life. But he was like, hey, my mom was like, um, he really doesn't do well at the kitchen table. I'm like, okay, what does that look like? So we get there, and this boy has significant autism, and they bring him to the kitchen table, and he's already stiffening up. And of course, you know, he's a little guy. So this is, remember the, the diagram? You have a little control. You can kind of, you can get him there if you really want to. And he gets there, and he sits in the table, and he arches his back, you know, and you put something in front of him, and he swipes it on the floor. I mean, it's like, and it gets worse and worse and worse. I mean, at one point, this is, I would, this is my first week in the home. I remember at one point, he was literally crawling, this is a giant kitchen table, crawling across, like just running, crawling across the kitchen table, like just get me out of here. Like screaming, yelling, you name it. Like, I'm like, this isn't gonna work. There's nothing we can do. And this is before I went to this training. There's nothing we're gonna, I mean, I had some tools in my bag, but I'm like, well, we, this is like, this is impossible. He won't sit at the table. And why? Because, I don't know, weeks, months before I got there, and, there was a, this has happened every day, every day. So as, um, as a, 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 I'm a big fan of Vincent Carbone. He's a well-known behavioralist. He's like, he, he sees a worsening condition. 
It's like you're about to pull on 95 and you see all the cars. You're like, oh my gosh, let me pull off. The worsening condition, get me out of here. So we had to like start over with this kid completely. So he'd go to the table and there wasn't food, there was just toys, just toys. This table, we had to neutralize the whole table, make it nice, make it fun, yada, yada, yada. And then to that one article that I did that Google search, you know, that one article said, oh, pair it with something that's preferred. That's exactly what we did. We paired it with all kinds of fun stuff. Eventually he got, he got to the point where he was able to be available at the table. That's not what this talks about, but I'm like, but that does have to eventually happen. You have to be able to kind of like have it be at the table. Okay, so this is, the, this is the good news. So the good news was that you just have to try something. The really good news is that size does not matter. I'm gonna say that again. Size of what you try does not matter. The research is very clear on this. Dr. Williams tried to impress this to the crowd of people out there in this auditorium. He goes, if I have to, I'll take a pea and I'll slice it up into 10 little pieces. And if the child only needs to eat one-tenth of that pea, so be it. It doesn't matter because it's one step. All, think about it. As far as trying something, as far as literally like the definition of trying something, nowhere in there does it have to be have to 10 peas, 20 peas, a bowl of peas, even one pea. It's all abstract. If you just try one thing, if you get over that behavioral hump, think about everything. The child has to agree to that at that point and swallow. That's the definition. You have to swallow it. Spitting it out didn't count. Gagging doesn't count. Cut it small if you have to. Once you get past that, ding, 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 you're on your way. So I, I said, okay, Todd, what behavior would represent this? Like get out of the food area, that's what behavior? I'm like thinking, well, I don't know. Like I'm not a golfer, but I'm like, well, you know, when someone learns how to hold a golf club, I don't know. So I said, you know what? Let me think of a real good one. A right-handed person wants to learn how to throw a ball left-handed. Have you ever tried that? All right. If you're left-handed, it'd be the other way. It is, in my opinion, like impossible. impossible. It looks so silly. So yeah, let me try this. Let me, let, me, let me try it. Let me look into this. So you look out there, and you'll see stuff like, oh, 15 minutes a day, the average person, two to three months. It's kind of a wide range there, but 60 to 90 day trials. One kid, one kid filmed himself little short clips, this little teenager out there in the backyard. His parents must have been really proud, like, wow, he's not in a video game. He's throwing, a, he's learning how to pitch left-handed. 150 days, that's how, the little clips, 150 trials. You could see it, awkward, 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 you know, like, watch out, duck your head, and then all of a sudden, like, day so-and-so, we hear a bing, because he hit the pail, and eventually got to the point. So, right, it doesn't, it, he didn't have to do it all day long. It's the 150 days, not a half a day every time. That one was 15 minutes a day for two or three months. So it's just it's all behavior. It doesn't matter what the behavior is. We're talking about eating now, but any new behavior that's challenging, right? It's repetition. It's not the size. People who study, they found that out too. You know, you're like, you know, if you have a, a certain amount of material, I tell these kids all the time, you're studying for something, you know? You have only four hours. You know, do you spend all four hours at the end? Do you take, do you go two and two? Do you divide it up in 30 minutes? Right? The more exposures you have, usually the better results you, ha you get. They've shown that. So it's like, it, this doesn't, this isn't, uh, we're not inventing something new here. It's about eating, and it has some, there's some emotional stuff that comes with that because it's your children. I get that. But behavior's behavior, and it's like, okay. So that was good news, I thought. You know, the size, I thought it was really good news. The good news is that there's an average for 15, okay? We all have a number, okay? We start off with a number. Now, the really, really, really good news is, is that whatever that number is, so I said the average is 15. So for a young person growing up, maybe their number is 12. Maybe that person's number is 30. We all have a number that I'll get to in a second, an average number. But then 
for every new novel food item that you make your way through, that number goes down. Now, if that's not good news, I don't know what is, because there's hope. There is a light at the end of this tunnel. And this is all based on this research article. So this is why this is not Googled. Who wants to Google that? Anyways, so these are, I'm going to have a blow up of this in a second. But what do you notice about, what do you notice about this chart, these charts? There's all something in common with every one of them. What do you think it is? They all start what? On what end? On the high end, right? And on average, over time, what direction do they go? They go down. This is the opposite of what we want for the stock market, right? The stock market goes up over time. You reverse that, that would be the stock market over time. So this, the trend goes down. The trend goes down. Now, now what am I looking at? Okay, what, I, what you're looking at is that every dot is a food item. So this dot here is a food item. That person needed to try it one time and they were able to tolerate it or like it. That's just luck there, okay? This one, this next food item, it took like nine times. So every dot is a brand new food item that they eventually learned to tolerate or like. So let's look at this a little more closer. Here it is. Those three of those blowing up a bit. So again, food item. A new food item, another new food item. So this food item here took probably, it looks like maybe seven times, seven different times of trying, a little bit, right? To be like, okay, no more behaviors around this, I accept this is fine. What's the test of accepting it? Not refusing it. Or if it's sitting in front of you, just, all right, I'll eat that, boom. I'm fine with that, you know? And so here's the thing. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. This is fun to look at. But this is one child, this is another child, this is another child. There's a story behind every one of these, though. There's a story of perseverance behind every one of these. Because, I mean, look at this journey. That, they got really lucky there. I think it was one time, and they liked that food item. They jump up here, uh-oh, that took eight times. But then imagine that family, like, oh, the second one only took like eight times, seven times. And it was, oh, look, it's going down. Oh, that tough day. And then look at this one. 35. I don't know what that was, but it was something he didn't like or she didn't like. And whether she ended up or he ended up tolerating like it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. Like, I just stopped refusing. Okay. I, I, you know, like me, I don't know about you guys. I like carrots. Um, I've yet to really, I don't like artichokes. I, I don't know. I just, I'll tolerate it. So you don't have to like it. Like, this is not food. This is basically just getting over the hump. So, but imagine this. Come on, think about it. When they got to like 25, don't you think someone wanted to quit at that point? Because they're like, wait a minute, this is not working. Finally got to this point, they're like, this better, you know, and all of a sudden, look, reward. You know, so any data point by itself. Is, is a whole thing, but eventually the trend goes down. I told you the average number, so this kid's average number in the beginning, if you just look at that real quick, if you just took that little sample there, maybe the average is, you know, 14 for him. But it's, it's not 14 over here. When you, the, the more times you get the lower number, you average, you're going down. Same with this thing, right? Look how high he started. I mean, like, look, the day one, he's just under 30, 30 times to try something, you know, different things. And then <laughs> down, and they're like, hallelujah, here, right? And I, I look at this one, I'm like, do they want to quit? Like 10, down, and then like this next one, okay, 14, next one, 16, next one. It's like, doctor, this is going the wrong way. It's supposed to be going, you told me the average was going down. Yes, just like the stock market goes up, but depends on how far back you look. <laughs> if you look at a one day, Two day, one week, one month, sometimes one year, not big enough. You gotta go back further. So you go back far enough, it will go down. So that's the good news, perseverance, getting through it. So no more of this. <laughs> so I don't know about you, half my family's from Wisconsin. I mean, we grew up in Connecticut, Easton, but not until I was six. So before that, 
half my family is from Wisconsin. The other half was from Missouri. And um, the Missouri side, they were farmers, growers, very agricultural based, very, very like conservative based. So what do you think happened when that was put in front, something like that was put in front of me? Okay, I'm not suggesting this at all, but there was no option. <laughs> you had to, you're gonna eat that, or you're gonna, you're gonna, your your bottom's gonna be sore. Now that's not what we do anymore. Okay, but I imagine how hard I looked like that too back then. That's like that's like we don't we had to get away from that. So this idea that you have to finish what's on your plate, you don't have to. Now, it's just about smallness, smallness, and over time. So. Is there anything we won't put in our mouth? Depending on how you look at it, sadly, probably not. Right? For most of us, the first time you have any of that, what's it like? Is it enjoyable the first time? I know some of this is addictive, but it's not enjoyable up front. Your taste buds are screaming no. Right? My dad, um, when he was alive, he, he liked scotch. And after I got into my adult years, I'm like, oh, let me try this. I, I, to this day, I think it's gross. Now, between you and I, I just haven't hit that number yet. <laughs> but I don't want to, because I like bourbon. I hit that number and I'm fine, right? But here's the thing, like we all have, this is for everybody, so there's really nothing, there's really nothing that a, a, a child eventually won't tolerate or like. I don't like liver to this day. I don't, I don't care what my, my, my average number is, what, it doesn't really matter. That's going to be one of those that just, it's, it's the average, so it goes both extremes. It's going to be like too high up. It's not worth it for me, right? But my wife, she does make stuffed artichokes. That's something I never grew up with. And she's half Italian. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to try this. Stuffed artichokes. You know, I don't like it as much as she does, but I tolerate it. It didn't take that long. So it's the same for all of us. So here's a, here's a, Here's the thing. This is just one, like, you'll, this, when you download the thing, the, the file, <clears throat> this is just one way to track. You just want to track stuff down. Preferred stuff, moderately preferred, and then brand new, right? Because you want to know, you, you want to kind of keep track of what your child, you, mean, you probably instinctively know what they like, but like, what do they like? Let's put that down and stuff that they're kind of okay with, you know? Because you're going to want, a combination of things depending on how what approach you want to use. So there's three approaches here that we're going to talk about based on the science. This first one is approach number one. Okay? So what this is here is five little novel food items. They're small on purpose to represent that they the size doesn't matter. And ding 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 ding. One, two. They're both rewards. Come on. Let's face it, you sit down, long class, you're taking an exam or whatever it is, a hard day at work. Don't tell me that's not an award. Reward is a reward. Escape. Get me out of here. Okay. Now, at the clinic, this is what this is the model they, they use a lot of because it's a clinic, right? You sign up. You're there. You have a time slot. They got to make this efficient. So literally, this is how he described it. Now, I'm going to modernize this a little bit because this was a, years ago that I went to this thing, but he's like, okay, in room, room, the first room, you have this right there. And then in the adjoining room, sometimes there's a window, you can see things that are really preferred, like a PS5 with your favorite game loaded on it and a bowl of popcorn, which is your favorite thing, your favorite beverage, it's all there. It's party time, party time. All you have to do is this. Now, don't forget, I mean, the kids with the challenging meat uh, eating, they're there for a reason. So this doesn't go, remember, this, is, this takes a while. This approach takes a while. And, and the kid could be there for 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, two hours. Time's up. We'll come back. We'll start again tomorrow. It's a, it's a, it's a clinic. So you're, you're checked in at a hotel somewhere. You're, gonna, you're committed to this. You're going to work through this. Um, so with this approach... Basically, it's, 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 it's compliance and, and directions, uh, highly preferred. Teach outside of normal meals. So it's not really easy to do at home. I mean, 
it's hard enough finding time to have meals and sports and homework and this or this or that and bringing kids around. So this is really is not a friendly way, uh, easy to thing to do at home, but it is what they do at the clinics, right? It is, it's, 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 a, it's a way to go. So that's approach number one. Number two is a little more user friendly. You have the novel food here and a preferred food there. And now the parent has control of the plates, right? And so first thing you do is you have one bite from plate A, and then you can have a bite from plate B. It takes a lot of instructional control with that, right? Because you're managing the plates. I mean, you know, the, the child has to agree that you're going to be doing this to a certain, you know, a certain point. Um, now, what they what they'll tell you is, is that um, this is pretty good though when it comes to there's greater choice, but when it comes to a, obesity, um, perhaps because just the practice of this really slows down the eating. Because you know, like the the food you want, you're like, you know, the food that you don't want, you can look at it a little bit. You, okay, fine, boom, and then boom. And you know, this slows it down, but it slows it down, okay? Back and forth, back and forth. So the problem, if there's a problem, and it might be, is that you have to do this for all meals. So remember, the first one is outside of meals. This one is all meals. Why is it all meals? Well, if you don't do it all meals, I'm just gonna really not eat much <laughs> at this one, and I'll just load up later on with the stuff I really want. So, and this is a challenge because, you know, at schools, like, you know, if your child's really struggling and they're going to school, obviously, you know, I mean, they would have to do this at school for this to really work. So, again, some good, but some bad. Uh, approach number three. Here's number three. Now, that's our novel food item, right? By size, you could tell. And these are all preferred. I like this stuff. Except, there's not a lot on the plate. In fact, that's probably one-third of what I normally would want to eat, what I'm normally accustomed to eating, my calorie intake. So, I, so this, in combination with locking up all the snacks, cutting down all the in-between meals, we'll get to that point. But that is something that has to be done. So that one little boy that I talked about when we eventually really got him to eat, we had to lock up all the snacks, which was not easy to do because it was a big house, lots of places to put these things, but you had to lock them up. You had to keep it away from him because like Calvin, he'll just eat when he's ready, when he wants to, it's something, something else. But um, in this case, if I'm not gonna eat, so I'm gonna eat that first, eat this second, eat that third, and then, um, hmm, I guess I'll have to eat this to get this. Right, the rest of my preferred stuff. Now, here's a funny thing. This is just anecdotal, but that one little boy, eventually when we got to this stage, you know, we started doing this in his life when he was older, and oh, and once he figured it out, it doesn't matter whether he has significant autism or not, like he figured it out. Which one of these things do you think he ate first? The less preferred. It's true. Get it out of the way. Because now when I get this out of the way, I got nothing but good stuff in front of me. Talk about, you know, delay of gratification. That wasn't even the point of the, <laughs> the intervention. But it's like, just get out of the way. Problem solved. Great. So this approach, the reason why this approach is so popular is because it's less stressful for the kid, less stressful for the kid, less stressful for the parent. And just one time a day, just one meal a day. Just fix it in one meal a day. Yeah. Okay, so your question is a good one. Do you put it next to each other? That depends. Because for this to work, right? Let me go back. It doesn't really matter what order he eats that in, but he cannot have that until that's gone. So, I, I love this. I went to law school for a reason, just for this line I wanted to give you. I, I, I didn't stay in law school, I went to psychology instead. 
But my favorite class in law school was property law. And you know what 90% of property law is based on? Possession. Do you have it? Chances are the law is going to lean your way. I learned about that. You know, squatters, for example, you have a piece of property that you're not paying attention to. Someone, le someone illegally moves in, stays there. You, if a certain amount of time goes by and you do nothing, legally, they're in favor. Possession. You have an argument with somebody, and that's my, you know, that's my um, whatever it is. No, that's mine, and the person has it, and you go to court. I mean, unless you have some real good evidence. So, when I say all this, if that child grabs that plate before eating this, I mean, for some cases, that's already game over. Like, uh, why am I going to really into a power struggle here? So you don't want you want to avoid the power struggle. If you're going to have the power struggle, they just can't have the plate. And you might have to go to bed hungry, like Calvin's dad. Go to bed. You might have to go to bed hungry, right? Hungrier than normal. Not starving, because you had something to eat. And eventually, this will, this will play. Here, I'll give you an example, too. You know, after I went to this workshop, it's like a three-day workshop, I come home, and I'm like, boom, ready to go. So I didn't get to use this with any of my clients yet, so who do you think I used it on? My youngest child. <laughs> he's, a little, he's a kid. He's just two years old. Probably two or three years old, young, small enough to be in a high chair. High chair, can't, can't leave, right? So I had him in there, and I'm like, okay, this is, you know, I, I obviously missed a lot of what was said, and over time I've come back and I was, oh, okay, this is where I messed up. I turned this into a power struggle because I was convinced that I was right, and I just get him over this hump. Oh, you just had to have a little bit of, just a tiny little bit of, um, remember I said size doesn't matter? Well, just a little bit of ground beef. That's it. Just put it in your mouth, you're done. And he, to this day, he's very strong-willed. And so he and I were in a battle. And I don't know, it must have been like an hour. My wife comes in the kitchen. She's just like, that's it. Get out. <laughs> and she took him and went to bed. She took him to bed. And that was it. And I, we, I told him on the way to the bus stop this morning, I'm going to say, I'm going to tell that story. He's like, don't say it. It's embarrassing. I'm like, they don't know who you are. <laughs> He's in high school now. Um, but the thing is, is that what I forgot was you don't have to do it all one day. If it doesn't work out today, we'll just do it tomorrow. Because the science is on my side, it's on your side. Is once, once they start to try something, they'll get it. And you know what? It doesn't have to be today. If I'm not feeling good, you're not feeling good, or we got locked into a battle, let's just call it and just go. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent question. So when you go, the question is, do you stick to one food? And do, okay, So you could if you want to. Um, you keep track here, like something like this. Keep track, right? So if you really dive into the research, I, I think they kind of come up with a number of how many days go by that's too long, you know, before it doesn't, you know. So I, I don't know that number, to be perfectly honest. I haven't gone back and looked at that. But in very practical terms, you probably don't want to start with more than two or three and just rotate them through. It doesn't have to be every single day, right? Time's on your side as long as, the, as long as you give yourself enough time, right? Think about it. It's like you don't have to, it's like it's over time. And so it's funny too because not to use, I, I knew that, I just knew based on all this research and just my own work with my clients that it's just trying it is the biggest thing. So even with my own kids, like, I just want them to try stuff. That's all they, and they realize that dad's going to leave me alone as long as I try this thing. And you know, now that they're older, I, I am so impressed that they try things that I never would even suggest that they would. So that's, that's cool. I think it's over time. It's just, yeah. Okay, great question. So you have kids of three different ages, young nine months, and then five and seven. Okay. So really, when you, come, when you think about it, think of it as a very holistic approach. Think about culture, family culture. What's our culture at our table? What do we do? We try things. That's it. We just try things. And so, you know, when you make something like um, a new dish, 
the expectation is we're just going to try it, and it's just a tiny bit. And that's, you know, and, 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 and if you want to, like, start slow and say, look, I have a we, dessert is, I, I, you might have different feelings about dessert. Dessert doesn't have to be cake, right? It could be, it, it could be anything. Some kids like a little bowl of cereal before they go to bed or, you know, like a little jello or whatever it doesn't matter. But, like, it could be something where, hey, you know, we, we try things here just a little bit. And look, mommy tries it. I did. We all different try it. Oh, good. You know, they'll say one of the kids tries it. Awesome. You know, and celebrate that. That might be good enough. At some point when you have like that dessert, you're like, look, anybody, could, you know, we just, we just try it. And then, of course, you, you can have your dessert later if you want, something like that. Like, so like without making it like negative, you just want to like in in encourage them. Like, hey, this is what it's all about. It doesn't, you don't have to use that model. It's more like a, an approach. Because once they all start to pick up on it, and kids are funny, you know, when their sister or brother start to try something and they get celebrated and a big deal and they get to sit and maybe you have the special seat. I remember growing up when my classes, the teacher said, okay, that back table with a really cool table, big chair, that's for the, the two kids in class who like are doing the best this week. Maybe you have like a special status for people who try things at home. Celebrate it. Have a name on the board to have a star next to every time you try something. Mom, dad, all of us, boom. Grandma comes over, you know, whatever. Like, you do that, and it's like pretty soon they start to get, you know, starts going that direction for you. Okay. Do that, and I'm sure the nine month will be the best eater. Okay. So, that boy, the one boy we talked about, I talked about a few times. Um, this is his, this was his diet pretty much. Um, so, I mean, this is well past him. When, I, when he was like fighting and screaming and leaving the table, um, he, uh, you know, that was when he was real young. This is more like probably third, fourth, fifth grade, third, fourth, fifth grade. And, you know, he got to the point where he really settled in on these kind of food items. He had more than this, but what do you notice about those food items? It's not so much taste. Hmm? They're white. Yeah, they're very light in color. They're white, aren't they? People grab onto this, to some variable. Out of all five senses, so in that research clinic, when they do the survey and they test out this or that, you know, the, my child has, has uh, some tactile defenses. They have this diagnosis, that diagnosis. They have oral motor challenges, really met anxiety. So out of all those things, which of the five senses do you think registered as the most significant as far as it control it, it correlated with this with the most resistance when it comes to behavior like resisting food which do you think smell taste what do you think hmm sight how did you know that does it say that somewhere in the slides do you work in a restaurant yeah you know sight visual visual now that, the other ones are important but visual so it's so wired into our brain. So I remember working in, when I was in my 20s and 30s in grad school in some of these really nice high-end restaurants. The chef spent all the time, right, on the front making sure that that plate goes out. It looks gorgeous. The last thing you want is something to look messy, sloppy, not appetizing. So anyways, but he, he was really into this, these four things and more. Okay, so we tried, we did approach number three, one meal, just one meal a day. This guy ate like probably six meals in one day. Huge crazer. And so you're like, oh, remember he had the whole back? So we had to do a little bit of that. But nowadays he's a grazer. But he, look what he eats. Look what he's finally started eating over time. This is post. So this is like, I took, a, I was like, oh, I gotta take pictures of these things, you know, like this wide variety of food. One, not one at a time, but one bite at a time, right? Like mom introduced this every so often, rotating in and out. The point is, is eventually, remember, he's the kid that eventually just figured it out real fast. Let's just put this in my mouth and get to move on. So that, that was, when that happened, we realized, in hindsight, it's 2020, it's like, bing, 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 that's it. He's, he's going to try it. We're on our way. It's just over time because we all have our number. Eventually, he starts actually liking some of those things he tries. Now, will he actually eat something that he just tolerates? To a certain degree, perhaps. But whether he likes it for this guy, more of a factor. I mean, just it, it's, you look at the, I like the colors, like the colors just to pop out the vegetables. The cool thing about this for me was 
his mom had a large, I think, a, I don't know, she had four kids, one of them significantly autistic, and um, she really put a lot of effort into cooking. That was her passion. She was very good at it. Um, her family really appreciated it. You know, she got a lot of value out of it. So the fact that this one guy, one out of four, would eat this stuff was a big deal to her. It was just like a big deal, you know? <clears throat> Keep going through. The hot dogs are still there. It's okay. <laughs> I just had a chili dog the other day, so who cares, right? I like that one because that's kale. That was not initially on the list. <laughs> Kale. So um, that was good stuff. OK, so helpful hints. So the research also shows this stuff. Some of this might be like pretty, pretty self, you know, self-explanatory, but I don't know. Eat on schedule, when possible. It just improves eating habits. Eating on schedule. Think about the routine across the week. If it's too varied, too off the charts, not predictable, that's, that, can, that can complicate things. Um, associate eating with sitting at the kitchen table or somewhere. So, all right. It's not, it's not like, you know, people, I, I, can, I think of this like a homework in some ways. If you look up like, well, what's good homework, homework habits? Well, the kid, you know, proper lighting, proper, you know, posture, sitting down at a desk or a table, less distraction, all good stuff. Okay. But well, how do you explain to kids sometimes who can listen to music and still get A's while doing his homework? Or the kids who do their homework in bed? Don't raise your hand. But I know people who have kids who do their homework in bed. I'm like, that, to me, growing up, that's just like, fine. I don't know. I, I never liked that. The proof is in the pudding, though. Why, though, sitting, eating at the table? Because if you, if you have a hard, if you're failing your classes and you're not having good homework hygiene, you probably have to really correct that. If you're having a hard time eating or struggling with trying things, the environment does matter. And you want the table to be a place, like that first boy who ran from the table, eventually had to get him to like want to be at the table. Being at the table is important, like things like that. And you know, and, and you know, so like uh, timing, place, certain rules, like you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's hard. Like, you know, think about a classroom. If the teachers and the, you know, and, and someone just keeps getting up out of that chair over and over and over again. And eventually, the teacher's going to have to turn around and help that child, kind of like stay a little bit more. You know, it's different if they have ADHD and they have to get up and walk a little bit. I mean, you have those breaks; that's fine. But you have to look at the your environment at home, and if it's too, if it's too unpredictable, you will probably want to start working on that first. Like, well, okay, we sit at the table first, we finish our meal, then we go. Or we want a break, that's fine, come back. But you have to have some kind of like routine or structure. Number four is a big one. Yes, so just like Calvin, you really have to, they, the child, all of us, will find our calorie intake one way or another if we can. So if you really want to make this work, um, if you're wondering, like, why are they putting up such a, a, a fight over this? I just, it's just one little food item. Why, you know, Ty didn't say it would take this long, whatever. Don't forget some of those charts, right? But the point is, is that if they're eating their, if they're coming home and they're having too many snacks or they get to have a snack after dinner or this or that or whatever, or they pile up on something else, it's, they're just going to satiate and it's, it's less of an issue. So being hungry in, in behavioral circles, they call that establishing operations or setting events. It's a big deal. Being hungry is a big deal as far as like conditioning a child to, be, to have the most higher probability of success. So yes, yeah, so you have to cut back on the snacks. I mentioned the packaging before, and um, and that's for, for your child that might be an important thing. Mixing up the plates a little bit, not getting so stuck on something, you know, um, which which be which would be good. Okay. Okay. So regardless, oh, gagging. So this is always kind of a uh, tough one. Because no, you know, gagging, you know, I think if you're a parent, it kind of makes you nervous. Like, you're gagging. You don't choke and um, kind of stuff. And so gagging can be considered a, um, involuntary, 
right? Reflex, like a behavior. Voluntary behavior, I do it on purpose. Involuntary behavior, I don't. So a long time ago, uh, an involuntary behavior would be my legs doing this when I'd be like talking in front of people. Like I couldn't stop it I, <laughs> if I wanted to. Like, okay, give me something to stop that. So what stopped it? Repetition over time, just like all behaviors. So with this, with this one, gagging, tough one. Um, anxiety, food sensitivity, tactile defenses, whatever they are, the formula is still the same. Go smaller, go smaller. If you gagged on that thing, I'll just make it even smaller. So, and, and it's just, you know, as long as it goes down, you know. Um, try to stay away from washing food down because it, it, it's like a little bit of a shortcut. But the problem with that is, is that you think success, drink that. But if that's what you have to do every single time, you're kind of like the child's not fully experiencing the trying of the food. So that's, that's the tricky thing. Medication is different, obviously. You, you, you find, medication, by the way, is the same thing. I had children who worked with, they say, Todd, they won't take their meds. And you, you kind of, you, if you can get it, you get those little capsules, right, that are from the pharmacy that are empty, fill them up with something that's um, obviously non-toxic, <laughs> baking soda, like that. And you just have them learn over time to start taking a little tablet. Same approach. Um, but, when, but you, of course, you drink with that. So with this, you, you, it's okay to have a drink afterwards and all that, and you don't make a big deal of it. But watch it because ultimately you're like, okay, that's good, but this next time you have to do that small bite without the water or count to 10, whatever, just to get over that hump. Um, but gagging, it's like, okay, get yourself feeling better, you know, and it's like, it might be really harsh. You might think it's harsh, but it's like you go back. If you're using this approach real quick, it's like, I want you to have this, you just have to, I'll cut that even smaller, and then you can have that plate. And if you wanna try it tomorrow, that's fine. But you know, like it just takes time. It just takes time, but that's tough. The gagging part's tough, vomiting, maybe even tougher. But the thing is that the, remember, the nice thing about it is, I think, what I find reassurance is that in the, in the, in the research article in the feeding clinic, they've seen it all, they've seen everything. Right, and it's just just a matter of repetition. Just like learning to throw a ball left-handed, you're not going to do it in one day. It might take two or three months. It took this one boy 180 days, whatever it was, days. It's like it will happen. You have time on your side as long as you give yourself enough time, and just stick with it. Stick with it. Stick with it. You threw up. Okay, we'll take a break. If you get hungry later, like okay, dinner's at five. You threw up at 5:15. Get yourself relaxed. You know, we'll watch a show, whatever it is. When you're hungry, let me know. We'll go back. I'll make that even smaller. And then you can have the rest of your dinner if you like. It's like it's just, it's, you just, it's like you avoid the power struggle, but you have to hold to the, um, the model. Otherwise, God forbid, they learn that vomiting gets them out of it. And that will happen, right? If you be careful, it could happen, right? So any kind of maladaptive behavior that gets you out of a stressful situation, that tends to, that looks like anxiety. Right, and so you gotta be careful with that. One funny story. So um, I work with a variety of kids, and I have a smaller practice now, part-time, because um, I'm doing some other stuff. But the, my latest example in this was I work with this boy, and uh, he's like, you know, he's 22. So we started this when he was 20. I remember we had a, we did something similar with the COVID shot. <laughs> like, you know, think about like he had to get a COVID shot. This is a couple years ago, and uh, vaccine. And so it was all about, okay, well, how, you know, at the time he was working through his eating. And, um, and so we're like, it's very similar to that. You know, you start small and all that, and we'll just start with a, a little pretend thing, you know, and just work our way up. Um, but anyways, this family, I remember, like, I just felt like I had to help them because um, they're, uh, they're an English family, which makes them especially lovely, lovely people. And... I remember the mom's story. They're like, they go back home to visit, visit mom in England. They're around in England, and their boy has moderate autism, high functioning autism. But uh, before we started to do anything, he had a very restricted diet. 
And, you know, I mean, they were like, it was late at night. Like, just try the fish and chips. Just try the fish and chips. And he wouldn't have it. And his, his go-to food was pizza, you know, maybe three times a day, tw twice a day for sure. And she's like, she's like, Todd, you can't find a pizza place. And you know, they're running around, like, driving himself crazy. And I'm like, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. Once you're back at home, you know, like, we get back at home now, let's come up with a list. He will just have a little sample. And, you know, the long story short, he's, he's on like a, a three, three or four different food items now. And uh, who knew? Mozzarella sticks aren't that bad. <laughs> so, you know, but it wasn't in his diet. But uh, you see the similarity, though, right? But the point is that, you know, you know cheeseburger and this or this or that and, you know, chicken tenders. Like, I mean, that's not like really healthy eating yet, but he's just got to try stuff and realize that, okay, I try something, it's okay. And then be build from there, build from there, build from there. And most importantly, the family won't get stuck next time they're on vacation, like, you know, without any alternatives. So, all right. So now we're at a point where we have any kind of questions. Any thoughts?